It's another world in Idaho's underground. We'll take you on a spectacular trip under the surface of the earth. The harsh, twisted landscapes at Craters of the Moon are graced with the season of color. And strap on your seatbelt for an Idaho road trip to see some natural wonders of our state. Exploring Idaho's desert land usually means pretty plain scenery. Tall, dry grasses, a few rocky hillsides, and of course, it's hot. But today, we're going to look beyond the surface to find a cool, dark, beautiful secret. Openings in the ground like this at Cuna Cave lead to a completely different world. There are about 400 known caves in Idaho, one of the most spectacular, the Minnetonka Cave in the southeastern part of the state. Drip by drip, these limestone deposits have built up over thousands of years, until finally, from top to bottom, they meet in natural columns of the underground. A ladder is installed here at Cuna Cave near Boise, so climbers really have an easy way down, but there are still plenty of wild caves around where it takes skill and agility to make your way. We travel with a group of cavers to one such place near Shoshone. Idaho's desert landscapes hide pockets of adventure. People always look above ground. They never think of, of what might be under the ground. It's a whole other world that you just would never think about being there. But Idaho's cavers do. They'll drive for miles to find the gateways to their dark sport. Okay, helmet, helmet mounted light, cave pack, make sure we got our extra light in it. The most important piece of equipment. Backup light source. Light and more light. Another light. Once you see inside this dark and isolated entrance, it's easy to understand why cavers can never bring too many lights. Oh, this looks like a new cave. Let's go find out where it goes. Yeah. This cave was made about 15,000 years ago. The rocks we walk on were once molten lava. Now they're hardened into black basalt. Up ahead, there are belly crawls, pitfalls, tight squeezes, and bizarre formations. But the first stop for David Kessner and his party of friends is at the cave register. The tube contains basic information about the cave and a series of questions. Who's using the cave, what they're using it for, what sort of equipment they have. It may seem like trivial information, but it can mean the difference between life and death. Now if an accident happens, rescue crews will know exactly who is in the cave and how long they've been here. Eric makes a last check on his batteries. You usually take three times as many as you think you'll need. Oh, much better. Darren's ready with his light. Go ahead and turn your headlight on, Talon. There we go. And the adventure begins. Okay. This particular uh, cave is pretty nice in that it has a lot of big open wide passage area that's easy to walk through as far as not having to squeeze down or bang your head as you can see here. Even so, leave your claustrophobia behind because these cold walls will continue to narrow. This is some soda straws. It forms. This mineral formation is one of the unique treats down here. When droplets of water come down, they harden and they form soda straws. Another kind of formation looks like it belongs underwater. Right here we have some cave coral. As you can see, almost the entire passage here is covered in, in mineral formations. This blanket of white Probably is a mineral called the, gypsum. The, the it seeps the inside the cave dissolved in water then hardens into white decorations. 
Some things are harder to see in the dim light, like this wall. It's striped with minerals, from dark to light and light to dark. Looks like tiger stripes. The cave features that you see are just beautiful. The different colors that you see in lava where you wouldn't expect to see them. And then, you know, suddenly you might be surprised by sudden pits that open up in the floor. This pit is about 30 feet deep. Now you be real careful getting next to the edge. There's a lot of loose rocks that you might slip on. Down here, careful footsteps are required. Caves are an extremely delicate environment. We're talking about things that take thousands, hundreds of thousands of years to form and can be wiped out in a second with one careless hand stroke. Are you clear, Eric? Here is where the walls close in. It's a tight squeeze to fit through this hole, and that's just the beginning. It starts getting smaller and smaller and smaller as we go through here. Are you ready? Yep. Let's go see how small we can get. So, with a crawl, and a climb. The cavers make it back to a tunnel that's just the right size for Talon. Looks like it keeps going and going and going and going. Why don't you go ahead and go into that first little room so you can turn around and then come back so you don't have to back out. Talon's been caving for as long as he can remember, so small spaces don't phase him. Well, I am quite small, and there are always ways you can, you can just turn around and go back. Now it's time for the group to go back and leave this other world underground. Caving is a really fun sport, and it's a, a growing sport. If you think about it, there's not too many places where you can be in total darkness, and you don't very often get to experience silence. And here, in the dark, it becomes clear the isolation of a cave can heighten your senses. You can start hearing things better. You can start feeling things better. There's things that you see in there you just can't see anywhere else in the world. I really like it. It is very awesome. And I really think you should see it. Awesome, indeed. And one of the things that makes the Shoshone Cave so special is the lack of graffiti. Quite a contrast here at the Cuna Cave. Take a look. Spray paint absolutely covers the cave walls. And along the floor of the cave, trash is strewn everywhere. Now, the BLM is looking for people all the time who are willing to help clean this up and keep it that way. So if you would like to help out and make the Cuna Cave as spectacular as the Shoshone Cave, give them a call. We'll have the number for you later in the show. Exploring Idaho, we'll be right back. Coming up, proof that plants can survive almost anywhere. You know, it's kind of eerie inside a cave, but there is a place in Idaho that is so eerie, even evil looking, that early pioneers went out of their way to avoid it. On hunting trips, Shoshone Indians skirted the area. Even gold and silver miners found absolutely no reason to cross the lava fields and twisted landscapes of Craters of the Moon National Monument. But this summer, there are hundreds of colorful little reasons for you to go there. Today, we visit Craters of the Moon in full bloom. In the harsh, desolate environment of Craters of the Moon, monoliths of lava spear the sky. Dead, twisted branches suggest a barren place, and ropes of lava soak heat from the sun. At first look, it's as lifeless as the moon itself. An early visitor to the monument, he happened to be a minister. Um, he thought it would be a garden fit for the devil himself, so he named it Devil's Orchard. But even in the Devil's Orchard, hellish landscapes reveal bright surprises like blooms of yellow in a field of black, carpets of fuchsia on a lava hillside, and white flowers rooted in rock. And that's the bitter root. All you've got is these, the stem with the blossom sticking up out of the cinders. Lee Taylor Edmondson is a ranger at the park. She says early summer is a special season. People who just end up here this time of year, I feel like they're so lucky. They just hit it at exactly the right time. Yeah, it's different, isn't it? <laughs> Aren't they beautiful? Where are you guys from? 
This group from Iowa is amazed by the number of wildflowers, many they've never seen before. This is monkey flower right here. That's a monkey flower? Yeah, they can only bloom as long as there's still a little moisture in that top inch of soil. This is the dwarf buckwheat. It's got these, this low mat of very light colored leaves and then these pom-pom like yellow flowers sticking up. You picked the perfect time and the perfect year if you want to see wildflowers. Yeah, because, by accident. Yeah. You, know, you, you lucked out then because this was a great day to come and see them. This is great. Yeah. Everything that grows here on the monument has to have a specific adaptation for it to survive. Ranger Paul Allen shows visitors how life on the lava um, the requires buckwheat, persistence. They, this plant will come back next year, and they have a couple of interesting adaptations that make it so they can survive. That's the protective coating, and then you break it. And beneath that, you'll see the green of the leaf. You can see that the branches here on them are just extremely flexible. That's because the wind blows here every day, and it blows hard every day. Visitor Sandra Kramer is from California. I can't believe it. There's no dirt. It's just rocks. This is her first visit to Craters of the Moon. It's actually a little bee in there. It's nothing like she expected. I never imagined this was Idaho. I mean, I thought they grew potatoes out here. <laughs> I didn't know it was supposed to be beautiful. With sights like the bright red of this Indian paintbrush and lush fern that grows in a crack, the plants at Craters of the Moon prove that nature is full of surprises. I don't think that you could get a more impressive flower season than the one we're having right now. I just, I can't imagine that it could be more than this. And you can still see the wildflowers. They'll be in bloom through August. But summer isn't the only time to visit Craters of the Moon National Monument. Sometime, try a trip in winter. A blanket of snow transforms the landscapes into smooth shapes. But the park maintains an otherworldly aura. Seven miles of groomed cross-country ski trails will take you on an unforgettable tour. It really is an incredible place. Coming up, did you know Idaho is home to the world's only man-made geyser? This is just one of the stops on a scenic Idaho road tour. Next. Welcome back to Exploring Idaho. If you're the kind of person who likes to explore places like the Cuna Cave, but you just don't have much time, then we have the story for you. Jennifer Eisenhardt is here with the details. That's right, Do you get ready to buckle up because we're gonna take you on a road trip through Southeast Idaho. Highway 30 winds through natural wonders like the world's only man-made geyser, natural hot springs, and the original path of the Oregon Trail. but you can still get your kicks on Highway 30. It's about 80 miles from here to the border, and along the way, you'll find dozens of places where you'll know you want to stop, and others that may surprise you. Just in time for breakfast, a roadside shed sells home-baked loaves of bread. Katie's Bread Shed, huh? What's your name? Mindy. Mindy at Katie's Bread Shed says the blue light special is always on. The wheat's $1.99. Cinnamon raisin, wheat, white, and pumpkin bread. Is it good? Yeah. It's a slice of Americana. How about a loaf of pumpkin bread? Just off the highway. Mmm, this looks good. Thank you. If you're looking for adventure, you'll find it in Lava Hot Springs. The town gets its name from the naturally hot water that flows into large soak pools. 
dip a toe and you'll find nature heats water as well as any hot tub. And some say... It's real good healing water. The hot springs come complete with a fountain of youth. But wouldn't you know it, it's empty. Even so, Glenn from Wyoming says the 102 to 112 degree waters make him feel young again. Well, it makes your arthritis feel good. I come up here when I'm aching and I don't feel no aching when I leave here. Downtown Lava Hot Springs is lined with shops. The owner of this one likes to keep merchandise in a high profile. But the approach to business is as laid back as the town itself. At one end of town, pick your height on a high dive and splash into an Olympic-sized pool. At the other end, rent an inner tube and take a cool ride on the river. It's a great place. Back on the road, the windows are filled with farm scenes. Fields of alfalfa stretch for miles. Other more colorful crops brighten the drive. Since the days of settlers, this land has been handed down. Reminders of the Old West stand by the highway. Take a turn up Old Highway 30, and you'll find a place where the frontier days stand still. The town of Chesterfield is history preserved. Remnants of the settler lifestyle dot the landscape, from old farm equipment to hand-built log cabins. The town church still stands, Inside, you'll find the original pews, the original wood stove, and original photographs of the town's founders. And the general store is in surprisingly good shape. Even the old hand crank gas pump sits out front. Nearby, the Oregon Trail Golf Course sits on a piece of land where the Pioneer Saga played out. This low spot was once the Oregon Trail. Under the grass here, you can still see the ruts left by wagon wheels. In the 1800s, it connected all the way to California. Today, it links the eighth and ninth holes. And now, a different kind of wagon rides this trail, but at a distance, the sights are just as wild. A favorite stop for travelers on the Oregon Trail was at Soda Springs. And after 100 years, things remain the same. Today, tourists visit the area to taste the natural soda water at Hooper Spring. Dip a cup and take a sip and you'll taste. Mother Nature has her own version of club soda. But in the case of the Soda Springs geyser, nature gets a little help. This is the world's only man-made geyser, run by a valve and a timer. It shoots into the air every hour to the delight of many children. Not much farther down the road is a place where the wild side of the Old West left its mark. The tree-lined Main Street of Montpelier leads up to a famous spot, the site of the bank robbery of 1896. It happened on this street at this building. It was an average August day until a notorious group of outlaws rode up and robbed the Bank of Montpelier. Butch Cassidy and his wild bunch got off with more than $16,000 in cash. A Montpelier deputy borrowed a bicycle and chased the group out of town, but Cassidy never was caught. Today, residents remember the famous robbery with reenactments of shootouts. Hey, Japanese camera, huh? Is that worth anything? Many tourists are taken over by the band of bandits. We managed to escape with our lives. But you don't want to rush through this kind of country. I wonder if Butch Cassidy realized what he was running from. His underhanded occupation forced him out of Idaho, but not me. My job stops at the border. Of course, we'd much rather be in Idaho. Oh, of course, absolutely. But if I want to take that same trip, see those sites, about how long will it take me? 
Well, it took us about one day, but there's also camping along the way and RV camping sites, so you can pretty much take as much time as you like. It's beautiful. It looks like a lot of fun. Thanks, Jennifer. We'll be right back. Earlier, we showed you the wildflowers at Craters of the Moon National Monument. Do you know who went through special training courses in geology and map reading at Craters of the Moon? That training led to one giant leap for mankind. We'll be right back with the answer. Could you figure out who used Craters of the Moon National Monument as a training ground? The moon-like surfaces were good practice for astronauts of the Apollo flights. In the late 60s and early 70s, Apollo astronauts went through special training in geology and map reading here before their missions to the moon. If you have any questions for us about the stories you've seen on today's show, call this number and ask for the Exploring Idaho Field Notes. Be sure to request the Field Notes for show number 127. Thank you for exploring Idaho with us today. We're going to leave you with another geologic wonder of Idaho, the City of Rocks. As the pioneers made their way across the Oregon Trail, many of them took a cutoff called the California Trail. It took them past one of the most unusual places in the country, an uncommon collection of massive granite sculptures. The City of Rocks is south of Burley, near the Utah border. It is a National Historic Landmark and offers full facilities for day trips and camping. And if you visit the city, you'll have plenty of company. It's one of the most popular rock climbing spots in the world.